Well, good morning again. This Lent, we are reflecting on the seven I am statements of Jesus. And just a quick reminder from last week's introduction to the series, when Jesus says, I am, he's using the language of the divine name that God gave to Moses. So if Jesus uh, were to wear a hi, my name is sticker, right? It would say, I am. That's the divine name that God gave to Moses. So when Jesus says, I am, he's claiming equality with God and then providing us with a metaphor to wrap our minds around what that means. Last week, we learned a little bit about sheep. And we adjusted some misconceptions about them, and we considered Jesus as the gate. He is a source of protection for the sheep. And this week, we're going to learn a little bit more about shepherds. So would you hear the word of the Lord as it comes to us from the Gospel of John in the New Living Translation? We're reading out of chapter 10 again this week, but we'll be reading verses 11 through 16. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him, and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me, just as my Father knows me, and I know the Father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, too, that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You'll notice that Jesus doesn't just call himself a shepherd, right? He qualifies that statement and says, I am the good shepherd. And the word good that we translate into English as good it is full of a very rich meaning that the English kind of mutes a little bit. When we hear Jesus say, I am a good shepherd, that word good uh, also means beautiful but not in the sense of appearance. He's not saying I'm a good-looking shepherd. That's not it. He's saying I'm beautiful. In the way that skill which inspires awe is beautiful. Like when Steph Curry hits threes over and over and over again, and you're just like, wow, that is beautiful. He is crazy good at that. That's the sense of that word, good. The way Jesus performs the duties of a shepherd is unrivaled. That's what good shepherd means. Now, I'm fairly confident that we don't have any shepherds uh, in attendance this morning. Uh, so in or- if you are, I want to have coffee. But, it- but if not, um, in order to understand more about shepherds, And what Jesus is saying about himself specifically, it helps to know a little bit more about them. We live in a city context, so we're not used to shepherds. So let's learn about them. For much of Jewish history, shepherding was a very noble position. Maybe not how we always think about shepherds as nobles, but it was a noble profession. There were quite a few notable shepherds in Scripture. Adam and Eve's first uh, son, Abel, was the first shepherd. Abel found favor with God over his farming brother, Cain. So even in Genesis, right off the bat, we see that God has a soft spot for caretakers. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, King David, all shepherds. So were the prophets Amos and Zechariah. When the birth of the Lord is announced in Luke, it's announced first to shepherds. So that is a strong legacy of association that Jesus draws upon him. 
Another interesting fact, and I'm so good, glad to see some young people this morning. Uh, another interesting fact that many people are unlikely aware of is that 90%, 90% of the shepherding was performed by adolescents, people from 10 years old to 17 years old. And shepherding was one of the few tasks or roles that was not bound by gender restrictions. So many of the shepherds in the ancient Near East were girls. Pretty cool. David, before he was king, when he was a child shepherd, he clubbed several lions and bears to death before stepping up to slay Goliath. So young people... What I'm saying is, don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. But be an example to all the believers in what you say, in the way that you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. Shepherds were not the docile characters that we imagined. They didn't guide the sheep out into a field and then take a nap under a tree. Shepherding was hard work. The average flock was 100 sheep. That's why when Jesus tells the parable about the 99 sheep and the one that is lost, he's drawing on that. The average flock was 100 sheep. That's a lot of individuals to take care of. Can I hear it, teachers? Yeah? Yeah. A shepherd had to lead and protect and rescue and guide and care for the entire flock while juggling the needs of each individual animal. Young people, you're capable of more than you think. Older people, they're capable of more than we think. The shepherd had to protect the flock. They had to bring the sheep back because sheep are prone to wandering off. Not, like we said last week, not because they're stupid, but because they're curious. The shepherd had to find suitable pastures for grazing. It's not the sheep's job to find the field. It's the shepherd's. And then the the shepherd had to find still water for the sheep to drink because if the water's moving too fast, it startles the sheep and they won't drink. Shepherds had to move all the sheep from place to place in an orderly fashion and to tend to all of the animals that got hurt along the way. A shepherd's whole life revolved around their sheep. They ate around them, they slept around them, they lived around them. They spent a lot of time together. And the best shepherds loved and valued their sheep. They weren't just pets or things to take care of, but there was a deeper relationship there. And most commentators note that the self-identification of Jesus as the good shepherd leans heavily on the description of the Lord as David's shepherd in Psalm 23. Now, most of us know Psalm 23, but I want to read it back to you. Um, And here we get to see the role that Jesus is claiming to play in our regard. Now, um, I'm reading from the New Living, so this may not be the way you've memorized it or that you uh, hear it at a funeral, but listen to the Good Shepherd. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green pastures, or in green meadows, excuse me. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. The good shepherd provides for all of the sheep's needs. If we allow Jesus to be our shepherd, then he promises to meet all of our needs. If we let something else shepherd our lives, we're going to be stuck meeting our own needs, which, let's be honest, we're terrible at. We just are. We're not very good at it. 
A lot of the trouble and sin that we find ourselves in over the course of our journeys, over the course of our lives, is the result of poorly attempting to meet our own needs. Because we have come up, we have been raised in a culture that idolizes self-sufficiency to our detriment and our destruction. Sheep are inherently reliant creatures. And that bothers us. I mean, it bothers us because we have bought the lie that dependency is weakness, and it's not. To be dependent on somebody else is not weakness. You aren't called to meet your own needs because you weren't created with that capacity. You were not meant to carry that burden. It's hard to meet your own needs, and you weren't built or designed for that task. The good shepherd meets all our needs. Why? So that we can rest. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams, not the fast-moving kind that will start us, but the peaceful stream so that we can drink. He renews my strength. Rest. Do you remember what that was like? Have you had any lately? Or is the thing that's shepherding your life pushing you constantly to the brink? Here's another fun fact for you. Sabbath rest under the Jewish law was non-negotiable. It was enforceable by the death penalty. How ironic is that? Take a rest, or else. Do you know why? Do you know why the Jewish people were so serious about rest? It's the reason that Jesus had so many run-ins in the Gospels with the Pharisees who were rabid about not working on the Sabbath. It was designed as a gift, but it became an idol. Right? And don't, don't we do that a lot with God's gifts? He gives us something good, and we turn it into an idol. The whole point of work six days, take one off, is linked to the rhythm of creation, and it's to remind people that they are human beings, not human doings. And the severity of that law, the reason that a Sabbath had a death penalty, was to recalibrate the minds of a people who had been delivered from slavery in Egypt where their entire sense of self-worth and value was wrapped up in how many bricks they produced each day. How often do we measure our lives by what we do? Have you ever gone to a party you met somebody new and you asked them about themselves and their response is a description of their job? Is that really who you are? Because the good shepherd thinks you're more than just what you do for a living. And he invites us to rest. You are a sheep, not a machine. The good shepherd lets the sheep rest because he knows best what they need. And he knows where they are going. The good shepherd leads and guides the sheep. Now, how a shepherd gets sheep from one place to another is regionally specific. So mostly in the West, sheep are uh, driven forward, usually by dogs or shepherds in the back with air horns or cars or trucks or, or these little uh, ATV things, and, and the dogs drive the sheep forward. But in the Middle East, shepherding was different. The shepherd, who all of the sheep knew their voice, would go out in front of the sheep. They would walk ahead of the sheep, and they would call to the sheep, and the sheep would follow the voice of the shepherd. Shepherd leads them calls them, he goes out in front of them, and then the sheep follow. 
Because sheep don't spend their entire lives in the pens, the sheep pen that we talked about last week. When the night is over, the shepherd leads the flock out to graze, out into the open fields, places where you spend most of your time. Right now, you're in the sheep pen, and you're safe. But you're not going to stay here. You're going out into the world in a little bit. When your alarm clock goes off tomorrow morning, the shepherd's going to lead you back out into the fields where you spend most of your time. It's the shepherd's job to lead and to guide the sheep, which means that you don't have to come up with the route. Isn't that refreshing? You don't have to figure out the way. You just have to pay attention and listen and watch the shepherd and follow How much stress in your life could be relieved or alleviated if you would just follow instead of trying to constantly find your own way? If we keep our eye on our shepherd and we listen for his prompting, we're going to be okay. When the shepherd leads the sheep, he doesn't gather them all around and say, all right, sheep, come here, come here, come here. Here, you have a map, and you have a map, and you have a map, and you get the GPS coordinates, and you have a map. And so if you're looking around in your life and you're like, I don't see the map, I don't see the route, I don't see which way to go, it's because he didn't hand you a map. He said, listen to my voice and follow. And I will lead you, and I will guide you, and I will keep you safe because that's my job, not yours. Shepherd grants the sheep freedom in the field and then guides them from place to place. My kids, when we go somewhere, I can't tell you how many times, maybe you've experienced this too, we get out of the car, we're going somewhere, and they're like, let's go! And I'm like, you have no idea where we're going. And they don't care. Full blast, ready to go. Bam, out, out the gate. So we guide them. Whoa, 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 slow down, hold up. Not that way, this way, over here. Up, go, no, 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 come here, over here. Go. Don't cross. Look for traffic. Slow down. I was, for a while, when Judah was younger, uh, a stay-at-home dad, and uh, I would take Judah to the mall to walk, and, and I would let him run ahead because he, he was that kid. He wanted to get out and get ahead. And if you've met him, you know he's still that kid. He wants to get out there and go. And so I didn't know what he was doing. There's no handbook, right? When you become a parent, they don't go like, here's how you do it. So I would let Judah run for far enough, and then i go, <laughs> he'd freeze, right? It's this game of red light, green light. And then he'd wait for me to catch up, and I'd let him run ahead. And I'd go, <laughs> oh, stops. I catch up. And sometimes that's how God works in our lives. Sometimes he lets us run free, lets us stretch our legs because the the path is clear and it's okay and you can make some choices, you can go. And sometimes he reads the room or he reads the environment because he sees things that you don't and he says, no, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. This part, we're going to stick close. There's a lot of traffic. There's some danger here you can't see. Stay close to me. And when we get into a place where you can run in the field again, you can run again. The good shepherd leads because he knows what the sheep don't, and our lives are most abundant when we let Jesus lead. So be a dependent sheep. Don't be a stubborn donkey. Jesus goes on to contrast himself with hired hands. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him, and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. Now, I want to be really careful here that we don't read into the words of Jesus something that isn't there. If we're just reading through this quickly on our own, we might come away with the idea that Jesus is vilifying the hired hands, and he's not. He's making a distinction between himself and those who are necessarily less invested, right? Babysitters are not parents. They might love the children that they watch, but they didn't birth them, right? There's not that connection. Necessarily, there's a difference, and that's not bad. It just is what it is. It's different. 
A hired hand was responsible for the sheep up to a point. The law was that if a wolf came into the field and a hired hand was watching the sheep, if it was a single wolf, that hired hand had to kill that wolf or drive it off and protect the sheep. If it was two wolves, that was considered uh, an unavoidable accident, which is funny to me. I wonder how many honest hired hands were there. What happened to all my, my sheep? Was there more than one wolf? Yeah, there were like 70 wolves. There's so many wolves, right? The good shepherd wants to draw the sheep together, right? And the hired hand is only responsible up to a point. Do you see how wolves work? They scatter the sheep, and then they attack. Jesus wants to bring us in together. And it's not that the hired hands don't care about the sheep. It's not that they don't care at all. It's just that their concern has boundaries. It's a function of the position. The hired hand, by definition, means that the person's interest is paid to their, to their job, to their paycheck. You know this, right? Like, we've experienced this. You know that the person behind the counter at Chipotle is not there because they have a burning desire for exquisite Mexican cuisine. They're there to make a wage so they can provide for their needs. And they might be the best customer service that you've ever had, but I guarantee you, at the end of their shift, they're not going home thinking about you. They're there to do a job. They can do it well. They're not calling being like, how did the bull treat you? I really need to know. Was the guac worth it? We have to be careful not to mistake hired hands, even the ones we like and we admire, those people in authority over us or serving us as substitutes for the good shepherd. The point that Jesus is making is that even well-intentioned hired hands, those people in authority over you, including your pastors, have limits. I love you. I really, really, really do. I love you. And I will fight off 10 wolves for you if I can. But I can't do for you what Jesus can. Only Jesus saves. Only Jesus knows you with unrivaled intimacy. Only Jesus is going to know the depths of you and be able to meet your needs in that specific way. Jesus goes on to say, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and they know me just as my father knows me and I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. Jesus and the Father were one, and that's how well Jesus knows you. This is a level of intimacy that every person on the planet is longing for, and we go to great lengths to obtain it, and unfortunately, it's often in sources that can't fully provide it. Jesus knows every hair on your head. Now, for some of you, that was more impressive when you were younger. Don't get mad at me. I'm a hired hand. Give me a break. Jesus knows what makes you tick because he made you. He knows what makes you tick because he made you. He knows you better than you know yourself. And guess what? He loves you anyway. He knows everything there is to know about you. All those things that you think are secrets, he knows and still loves you. He loves you so much that he died to prove it. He looked over every sin that you've ever committed and all the ones that you're going to go on, despite your best efforts to commit, looked at the entire list, saw where it was headed, and looked at his father and said, take me instead. Take me instead. I said earlier that the average flock had 100 sheep. There's only so much land, right? There's like only so many places that you can graze those sheep. So often, shepherds would allow the flocks to mingle in the same field. That's you. 
You, you mingle in the same field with, with other sheep that are out there, right? Maybe they go to different churches or they don't go to church at all. You're, you're out there amid the other sheep. And when it was time, the shepherd would call for their sheep to come in, and the sheep would come running. And sheep, like I said last week, are smart. So if you had two sheep standing next to one another, and one hears the shepherd's voice, the other one's still too busy chowing down, the sheep are smart enough, they'll bump the other sheep. Hey, he's calling, let's go. They'll nudge him, hey, come on, let's go, it's time to go, the shepherd's calling. Jesus concludes this morning by saying, I have other sheep too that are not in the sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. Now his original audience is the Jews, but he's talking about the Gentiles. And by extension, he's talking about us. He's talking about you and he's talking about me and he's talking about this church. And he uses the phrase, I have. Not I will have, I have, which shows the sheep already belong to Christ, even though they have not yet been brought to him. There are people in this city, there are people in your lives right now that belong to Jesus, they just don't know it yet. There was a research group that did a... a, a nationwide survey recently, and that the results were shocking to me. They asked people uh, on all levels of faith, I have faith, I go to church, I don't go to, I'll never step foot in a church. I asked all these people about their faith journeys, and 82% of the people that were surveyed said, that if a Christian invited them to church, if it was a friend, somebody they trusted, they would go. 82%. And they asked the Christians, and 2% said, I would invite somebody to church. 82% are willing to come. 2% are willing to extend the invitation. The good shepherd offers us guidance and security and salvation and rest why on earth would we not want to offer that to the rest of the sheep around us? Do you know anybody who could use a little freedom, a little rest, a little security like we enjoy? When all our task is the nudge. Hey, do you hear that? Listen. It's up to the individual to listen. We extend the invitation, we let God do the rest. And we have no idea what the Holy Spirit is doing in the, in the background, behind the scenes in people's lives. So I want to challenge you to invite somebody to discover the Good Shepherd by inviting them to church. What happens after that is not up to you. Your job is just the invitation. You don't have to take a no personally if they give you a no. Because the shepherd over you is good, is unrivaled in how he does what he does. And Jesus loves the people around you just like he loves you. May we have the courage, the courage to help them hear his voice. And this week, when you are led out into the fields where you spend most of your time, may you do so relying on your good shepherd, who's so good at his job, it's mind-blowing. You can't even comprehend how he does what he does. May you let him, may you let him meet your needs so that you can rest. May you let him lead you and guide you so that you are relieved of the burden of trying to make your own way. And may you know that he loves you. The good shepherd loves you and knows you more than you can imagine. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father,
We give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for this flock. We give you thanks that you know us individually and intimately. Lord, we're tired. We are a tired flock. And we're tired because we've been trying to do it all on our own, and we just were gassed, Lord. So we ask that you would help us accept the invitation into rest, to trust you to meet our needs, to know that you can do it better than we can do it ourselves, to let go of control, to invite you in, to guide our lives, guide our paths. And God, may we be so refreshed. May our souls be so soothed that we can't help but share it with the people around us. Because we're looking around the field, Lord, and we see some other sheep that are struggling as well. Help us to be beacons of light and hope and peace and joy. Help us to share your love and give us the courage to do so. In Jesus' name we pray.